Great. Well, I have the, I have the real honor to, to introduce Lily this evening. Um, I'm Mike Cohen, who among many, one of my roles is to be a co-conspirator with Lily and, and in our program in, uh, in the Graduate Program in International Affairs. Uh, Lily, as I think everybody in, in the room knows, is somebody who, who thinks broadly about a lot of things and in very different ways and is never afraid to sort of challenge, challenge what, what is out there and to, in a very rigorous way. She's very demanding of herself. She's very demanding of her colleagues and of her students. And I think in that process really gets a tremendous amount of respect. So we're, it's a real moment of celebration tonight here. And so we're really delighted that, uh, that this is happening. And uh, I want to turn it over to Lily, who's going to introduce our, our panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. This is a, a great occasion, uh, not just for me, I feel, but for uh, GPIA and the university as a whole. First, I'd like to thank the two co-sponsors of this event. Uh, they are the Julian J. Studley Graduate Program in International Affairs, otherwise known as SGPIA, and the India-China Institute, otherwise known as ICI. Uh, the fabulous spread we have here with wine and snacks come from GPIA, and the videographing come, videotaping comes from uh, ISI. Uh, more than these uh, goodies that are being provided tonight, I'd like to thank the directors of SGPIA, Mike Cohen and ISI Ashok Gurung, for their support and friendship all these years. Thank you very much. And I'd like to introduce the panelists. We have three panelists tonight. And I will introduce, um, uh, the, the, uh, introduce them according to who came farthest. First is <laughs> Karen Smith from the University of Cape Town, South Africa, uh, in the middle here. Uh, secondly is Pyle Banerjee at the end from Smith College in Northampton, Massachusetts. Pyle also doubled as the interior decorator for this event, and uh, <laughs> that's why um, Mary Watson commented that this book launch is unlike any other book launch that she's been at. So thank you, Pyle. And David Plucky from Politics and SSR. Um, generally, I'd like to thank our guests from out of town who, because they're out of town, they're not here yet. Um, in particular, I'd like to thank Matt and Martha Bonham who um, are arriving from Syracuse, New York. And also Patricia Robertson, who, when she walks in, I'll introduce her again to you. Uh, Patricia uh, came from Philadelphia. But more than that, she is a childhood friend who grew up to be one of the best development editors around. Many people have asked me, how is it that I have been able to write two books? I have another book coming out next February. Uh, in the first year that I have undertaken my position as Associate Dean for Faculty Affairs. There's, there's Martha Bonham, <laughs> <laughs> who just arrived from Syracuse. Um, I presume Matt is parking the car. <laughs> and uh, so many have asked me, how is it that you were able to write two books in the first year of uh, taking on this new position? And I have to say that my secret weapon is uh, my childhood friend, Patricia Robertson. Uh, not only has she read every chapter, every line, every word, but she gave me really great uh, input on how I am making the argument in the book. And uh, it was not all work. It was uh, often a lot of fun because we'd have weekly phone calls and she'd say, you wrote what? Um, so uh, if any of you is thinking of writing a book or dissertation, I would uh, strongly uh, urge you to talk to uh, my childhood friend, Patty Robertson. Um, more generally, I'd like to thank my friends and colleagues here from the New School, students and former students who have come from afar to be here tonight. And last but not least, I'd like to thank my spouse person, Gavin Duffy, over there, <laughs> uh, for lighting and lightening my life with unbounded love, support, and joy since our student days. So thank you all for being here.
And now uh, I'm going to give a brief presentation of the book. Um, this presentation will be necessarily schematic due to time constraints, but I'm sure the discussants will bring out certain specifics that we can talk about during the Q&A, and also during the Q&A we can clarify some things that may seem opaque at first glance. Uh, for this presentation, I'd like to thank Nicolas Rodriguez for designing the Prezi presentation you will see tonight. The book asks a central question, which is how to deal with hegemony in international relations and world politics. By hegemony, I mean a singular logic of violence in world politics, both in what we do, such as in wars, as well as in how we think, such as definitions of knowledge, what qualifies as knowledge. This approach to world politics is called the Westphalian approach because it comes from the Treaty of Westphalia that was uh, signed in 1648 and which has been spread throughout the globe through five centuries of colonialism and imperialism. And the two main pillars of the Westphalian interstate, well, three main pillars of the Westphalian interstate system are that the international system is made up of states, and secondly, that uh, sovereignty is a main principle by which states interact with one another, and the third is that trade or commerce is the uh, legitimate venue for interstate interaction. This uh, Westphalia interstate system, I propose, uh, entrenches violence because uh, it offers a singular logic of what to do and how to think. Consequently, I propose worldism as an alternative paradigm for uh, IR world politics. Worldism comes from the notion that we live in a world of multiple worlds. And this world of multiple worlds is not a bubble of, or a framework that is established top down, but emanates from below through the multiple interactions among multiple worlds. Consequently, worldism is about negotiation. How do we negotiate across multiple logics, particularly if they conflict? For this reason, I draw on Taoist dialectics as an epistemology. Taoist dialectics in particular, uh, as you see from the graph, it is uh, a, a holistic organism composed of the black sphere and the white sphere with the uh, black, black dot in the white sphere and a white dot in the black sphere. And what uh, Taoist uh, dialectics uh, presents us is an alternative way to look at difference and how they interact into a, uh, a complementary uh, whole. From Taoist dialectics, I develop a model of dialogics, which is the dialectics of dialogue, which I call a worldist dialogic. And uh, it focuses specifically on creative listening and speaking as a mechanism for implementing worldist dialogics. Just briefly, creative listening refers to having the courage to speak when listening. And creative speaking refers to having the humility to listen when speaking. For if you don't have the courage to speak when listening and you are just listening, or if you don't have the humility of listening when speaking and you are just speaking, then both are conditions of hegemony. Neither transforms it. And uh, consequently, uh, I draw on uh, this uh, diagram of uh, Taoist dialectics of yin-yang relations to come up with um, an alternative epistemology for world politics. And this uh, Taoist dialectics uh, has um, five main features. Uh, it focuses on transformation. It's about balancing, particularly between dynamic relations. And it's about the dynamic relations between opposites and complementarities. And this concept includes subsidiary concepts like conflicts and complicities, differences and similarities, both inside and out. So keep in mind the white dot in black and the black dot in white. Equally important, Taoist dialectics is about aesthetics and creativity. Uh, it is not enough just to uh, do right or to think right. One must also feel right. The best way to understand the Tao is uh, through the metaphor of water. In fact, uh, Lao Tzu uh, referred to water as the highest form of the Tao. Water exemplifies the notion of inherent change because the same element could have opposites and complementarities within it, such as hot and cold, hard and soft, 
helpful and harmful. Water also represents not just fluidity, but also depth and in multiple layers. So you can have shallow all the way down. And the metaphor of water emphasizes the need for movement. Uh, you could contain water, but it would stagnate. Uh, water needs to flow to remain fresh and vital, similarly with knowledge and action. Uh, this explains, for example, why in Singapore, uh, having a pool of stagnant water is against the law, because we all know that it draws mosquitoes, and mosquitoes uh, carry disease. So the Tao, like water, needs to be free, flowing, and transformative. Now, our current world order is out of order, I would say. It's out of balance. Uh, the Westphalian understanding of the world outsizes any alternative understandings of the world. And I uh, label alternative understandings under the general rubric of multiple worlds. And this is an outsizing in name, not in fact. For in fact, uh, Westphalia world depends uh, intimately on the labor, the resources, the uh, legacies of multiple worlds. So that in actuality, there is all this exploitation going on, but no credit given in name. And what by, by that we mean in theory. So worldist dialogics tries to mend this gap by developing a method of exchange or communication or flow between Westphalia world and multiple worlds. And the world is mo model of dia uh, dialogics has three main components to it. Relationality, which surveys power relations. It asks who's saying what to whom and why. Uh, this uh, element uh, comes from constructivist, post-colonial, and post-colonial feminist theory on power relations. The second element is resonance, and uh, uh, its purpose is to detect systemic change. It asks, where are alternative discourses coming from and what do these mean? Now, this understanding of resonance comes from the Confucian observation about music, which is that if you pluck the string of one instrument, another instrument with a similar string will vibrate in response. So that's the kind of resonance uh, that um, I draw on here. Uh, to understand systemic change. In other words, where may different sites be vibrating in tandem to uh, give us a sense of the kind of change that is coming up? And the last element, uh, interbeing, serves as a guide to action. It asks, what can I do ethically and with compassion? This concept uh, draws from the Buddhist tenet of codependent arising. Uh, otherwise known as pratitya samuppada in Sanskrit and yuanxi in Chinese. I um, draw these three components into uh, the yin-yang diagram, and now I enlarge the border between yin and yang into an aesthetic zone, what I call the zone of engagement. So it's, it, the border is no longer f this thin line which is fixed between them, but rather expanded into a zone of engagement. And it is aestheticized. And the reason I aestheticize this border is to give greater range for identifying and acting on relationalities, resonances, and interbeings. And um, you'll see that the two pockets of co-implication, the white and black and black and white, also have borders. And so what I do then is to merge all of these borders together so that relationality, resonance, and interbeing uh, all operate in the zone of engagement. It's the next slide. Um, so that now the... Uh, Pockets of co-implication are driving the change within the uh, zone of engagement. As a thought experiment, I brought together two worldviews rarely introduced in the same breath. And these worldviews are Taoism and the Andean Cosmovision. The Andean Cosmovision comes from the worldview of the people of the Andes. Uh, rarely have these two traditions been brought together. Um, for, as you can imagine, geopolitical reasons. 
for if you were to compare, if you were to juxtapose these two traditions, you would find remarkable similarities between them. Uh, the Andean Cosmovision focuses on harmony, re reciprocity, creativity, and interconnectedness. The only difference between the two approaches is in what the Andean Cosmovision calls pacha, which is a um, time, space, body understanding of change and development. And in this time, space, body, pacha, the next one. The um, head signifies thinking, but also the future or the outside. The genitals signify uh, loving, uh, but also the past and the inside. And in the notion of pacha, it is the interaction between the past and the future that produces the present. And the present is represented by the heart and the stomach, uh, indicating the middle, uh, the middle part and uh, digestion. So uh, digestion is management. So you see that in one body, uh, this notion of pacha uh, in, uh, incorporates the future and the past and the present, uh, loving, thinking, and digestion, as well as the genitals, the head, and the heart, and the stomach. Now, when we bring together Taoism and Andeanism, the, their compatibilities that we discovered uh, allow us to create a hybrid model that overcomes this key difference between Taoism and Andeanism. And this is the hybrid model that I call yin yang pacha. From yin yang pacha, we have an understanding, we gain an understanding of why there is hegemony in today's world politics. That is, that uh, when Proposals for a liberal world order refuse to acknowledge the kind of colonial violences that have gone on for five centuries and yet want to benefit from all of the riches and resources that have come from these colonial violences in order to glorify or to set up the uh, Western liberal model as the way of the future, then necessarily the present has to be about hegemony in order to suppress uh, knowledge and dissent from these atrocities. However, in this yin-yang pacha model, not all is lost because as we have the yang, we also have the yin. In other words, the yin gives us access to how the world uh, acted and governed itself before Westphalia became dominant. And so we have alternatives to draw on. And from these alternatives, uh, we seek a goal not to replace or to overthrow Westphalia, but to reach a greater balance of coming towards the middle between the yin and the yang, so that there could be a greater balance between uh, Westphalia world and multiple worlds through creative listening and speaking. And it is uh, towards this goal, then, that uh, I have developed this model of worldist uh, dialogics. And from this goal, we come to a, an alternative understanding of the world as a worldly world order, not a world order of a singular violent logic. In this worldly world order, you see that it is composed of a circle, a square, and a triangle, all drawn with one brush stroke. This indicates that we can have difference without alienation. That is, the circle, the square, and the triangle are all distinct and yet they are linked, and they could not come into being without inter interaction with others. In this way, we may mitigate, not necessarily eradicate, but mitigate hegemony in our world politics and in our daily lives, thereby coming closer to what the Tao intends and has always intended, a world of care and compassion, love and resilience. Thank you. everybody. Firstly, I'd like to thank Lily for inviting me to participate in what is a very exciting event. Um, at the outset, I'm going to uh, say that I st I'm still suffering from a bit of jet lag, so if I don't speak any sense, um, you can blame it on me later. Um, also, my comments are very general, partly because the book is just so rich that it was really difficult for me to you know, decide what to focus on, and I, 
I see that some of my uh, fellow panelists are going to be focusing on specific chapters, which perhaps would have been a more manageable thing to do. Perhaps I should have done that. Um, but yeah, so having said that, I also wasn't sure how many of you had already read the book, so I didn't want to go into any specifics. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the, the introduction. So those of you who are familiar with the field of international relations, which is my field, um, know that, especially over the past decade, there's, there's been a groundswell of scholars, both from the global south and the north, who have questioned the continued applicability of existing mainstream Western theories um, in helping us to explain, especially the changes occurring in the international system at the moment, and helping us to make sense of the concerns of the majority of the world's population, not just a minority of them. There's increased recognition that there are certain questions that the Western archive cannot answer or actually has not even asked. There have been many calls for looking towards non-Western alternatives to existing theory. But most of these calls have remained just that, a recognition of the limitations of existing theory without offering a real alternative to scholars of international relations searching for a different way of approaching the study of world politics. I think this is partly due to a basic lack of imagination and creativity. Most IR scholars, and I include myself in that as well, come from a social sciences background where the emphasis driven by the dominant North American tradition is heavily on the science rather than the social aspect. This means that ways of looking at the world that are regarded as unscientific, uh, again, according to the subjective criteria of Western social science, are simply dismissed. In this way, many potential alternative insights are overlooked because they don't look or sound like the theory that we're used to. And this, I think, is related to the broader neoliberal project. Um, Anthony Bogues claims that at the heart of the neoliberal project is an attempt to capture the imagination of people and convince them that no other life is desirable or even possible. Imagining a different world today is thus essential. And in order to do this, I agree with Lily that we need to look beyond standard texts to other forms of expression like art and music. We need to broaden our understanding of what the archive is. In short, we need to think creatively. And I think this is where Lily's book is really groundbreaking. She helps us to imagine a different world and provides us with tools to deconstruct the existing Westphalian world and work towards a world based on very different values and principles. Her world as dialogics draws on aesthetics, which includes the private, the informal, and the fictional to complement the public, the formal, and the factual. It includes non-textual, non-verbal forms of communication like song and dance, plays, and everyday practices like cooking and eating. And I see that we have some dim sum at the back there. And of course, uh, she uses dim sum as an example of living dialectically in the book. Uh, I'm not going to say more. You'll have to go and read the book to find out more about that. Um, in fact, I found that her book reads like an adventure story. It includes an eclectic cast of characters, from historical characters like Marx, uh, Kuhn, Foucault, Fanon, to fictional characters like the ironically named fairy disillusion, who defend science and the search for truth. We're taken on a journey, stopping for breaks along the way. In fact, in the introduction, she entices us to continue reading in the following way. And I'm going to, to quote from the book, Reader, beware. We span films, novels, poems, songs, food, medicine, religious rituals, and historical context. We travel, travel over the ancient Silk Roads while also visiting contemporary Jamaica. We hear from a variety of subaltern voices over the centuries. For example, a 19th century former slave, a 3rd century Chinese noblewoman, a 7th century Buddhist monk, and a fictionalized version of an 18th century feminist poet from Vietnam. This all makes for very pleasurable but also very challenging reading, as it forces those of us used to reading standard IR texts out of our comfort zones. But there are also challenges to opening up the discipline to new sources of knowledge. Amitav Acharya, in a recent article, was skeptical about whether it's possible to bring insights, from example, Hinduism or Buddhism, into IR knowledge if we keep insisting on a conduct of, in of inquiry that demands a strict separation between this and otherworldliness and between the material and the spiritual. In chapter five, titled A Fairy Tale of Science, Lily engages with the question of science versus knowledge and fiction. In the chapter, which takes the form of a play, Thomas Kuhn, in response to reading a passage from Hayward Orker's book, Rediscoveries and Reformulation, comments that science is not always so scientific, but rather that it is a, that it is a human and therefore social endeavor, and that for this reason, science could be a kind of inspired creative storytelling. 
And Lily, I was wondering in whether you could perhaps elaborate on a bit on that in the Q&A um, and, and how you would deal with the argument that your work is not scientific um, and that it's not international relations. Um, in fact, you write that West, the Westphalia world may in fact dismiss Taoism as an ancient eccentricity. Um, so I was wondering, is it not again perhaps a matter not of who can speak or whether it's possible to provide alternative ways of looking at the world, uh, but about whether anyone will listen? Um, the notion of dialogue is another aspect of the book that, that, that comes out very strongly for me. And this, of course, has become important um, in moving the field of international relations forward. Many traditional mo mo models of dialogue, for example, the Socratic or the Habermasian, have, however, been discredited for maintaining hierarchies between participants or presupposing particular outcomes. In contrast, Taoist dialectics is based on the notion of ontological parity um, of different worlds. So this addresses concerns by scholars about dialogue between two inevitably unequal entities, for example, West and non-West. It also differs from the more well-known dialectical traditions of Hegel and Marx by including pockets of co-implication, as Lily has explained. And this speaks to the difference versus similarity debate that has arisen in discussions about theorizing from outside the West. Um, and those of you who are familiar with it will know that some scholars claim that the value of insights from the non-West is that they are different. Others see the focus on difference as further marginalizing, already marginalized, regions and actors. Others focus on similarity, arguing that most knowledge produced in the non-West is simply mimicry of Western knowledge. This has raised all kinds of questions around the origin of knowledge. Can we, for example, claim that democracy is of sole Western origin? In an, intercon in an interconnected world, uh, to what extent can any knowledge claim to be purely local? And I think um, Taoist dialectic suggests that the answer doesn't have to be either or. In yin and yang, because each retains elements of the other within, Taoist dialectics allows complementarities to prevail despite the contradictions between and within the polarities. So all social identities are recognized as forever in, entwined. This reinforces the Taoist notion that despite differences, there are also similarities. Importantly, I think Lily does not stop at developing world dialogics as a theoretical tool. She also applies its three elements, relationality, resonance, and interbeing to three case studies in the book. The one is US-China relations, the other is Taiwan-China relations, and the other is India-China relations. Um, in discussing the relationship between China and India, which I was particularly interested in, um, Lily qualified the discussion of interbeing by saying that it implies a concept only, um, an ideal and a goal, rather than being a reflection of the kinds of discussions and interactions that occur in reality. Um, she also proposed that everyday chatting uh, is a possible tool to resolve tense relations between China and India. Um, so Lily, again, this is something I'd like to hear more about. To what extent do you think the tools you prescribe in the book can actually be utilized in the practice and not just the study of international politics? Um, in chapter nine, as Lily has mentioned, in collaboration with Carolina Pinheiro, she puts Taoism and Andean cosmovision in, conver in conversation. And I found this very exciting because I think there's a lot of potential for future collaboration. Um, there are elements within Taoist philosophy that she explores in the book that I think resonate very strongly with, with African worldviews around the interconnectedness of humans, um, such as the African notion of Ubuntu. And I think this presents very exciting opportunities for, for future dialogue. Um, finally, in ending off, I don't know, Laurent, how far I am, how, how many minutes I have left, but... Uh, oh, great, okay, I, I'll, I'll speak slower now. Um, <laughs> With the, with the focus on, or with the book's focus on the possibilities of a world order not based on violence, coercion, inequality, but rather on peace, respect, care, love, Lily's book is particularly topical given the current plethora of views about future world order, which as we know are mostly centered on whose world order. And in referring to whose, it's mainly, is it going to be the USA or China's world order? instead of perhaps what the focus should be, in, in other, uh, namely, what kind of world order are we talking about? Not whose world order, but what kind of world order? Finally, for centuries, Western ideas and institutions have determined the nature of world orders. Now that material power is shifting, it's about time that we, well, that we start drawing on ideas from outside of the West as well. Lily's book sets a brave and ambitious example that I can only hope will serve as a model for many others to follow. Thanks, Lily.
Oh, okay. I'm going to move this uh, plant out of the way, if that's okay. Here, I'll just move it over here. No, no need to hide behind the uh, vegetation. Well, I didn't come from any place very far away, so if my talk is uh, disordered, it's not because of jet lag from 16th Street. That would be pushing it. Uh, I, w I would say that uh, in the sort of interdivisional uh, uh, exchanges around here, that uh, you, and I don't even know what the name of your division is any, anymore. I've lost track. It was like every. MSPB. Okay, well, every couple of weeks there would be a sort of bulletin from headquarters about a new name. So I, just, I gave up. But anyway, whatever it is, you do a great job with book launches and events in which your faculty uh, get up and present their work in a sort of congenial uh, setting. Uh, we do not do, I, I'm puzzled, I've done this two or three times now, and I'm uh, puzzled why that is, but it's notable that there's a, a, an enthusiastic spirit alongside the, um, the food and the <laughs> cheerfulness. So, of course, it could all be a strategy because, um, you know, it's notable that at a, a wedding or a christening or a bar mitzvah, once the proceedings are well underway, you're not supposed to talk in a very critical tone with regard to the uh, baby or the 13-year-old uh, or the groom. But so maybe it's a strategy. But let me let me uh, try to be a bit critical in a in a very friendly way. First of all, um, the the book has a number of major virtues uh, that are worth naming. And I guess the book is, is it actually physically out yet, or is it about to be out? Okay. <laughs> I, I, I got two oh, there. copies. One over there. Yeah, there's one over there. Well, Lil, Lily has offered to take your credit card numbers <laughs> as, as you leave. No, they're, so, they're flyers. They're, they're yeah, well, flyers. she'll take the numbers, too, and just send you the book and charge you a reasonable amount. But in any case, so I'm presuming you haven't yet read it. Uh, it's, first of all, it's, it's very intellectually ambitious, which is a good thing. It's aiming to reconstruct our thinking about world politics uh, as a whole. That's great. Second, in addition to that sort of ambition, it's very broad because it includes most of what's normally called IR theory, plus other dimensions of what are, is called comparative politics or studies of culture. And, and she's attentive to the fact that these are not all the same thing, but they, they play an interesting uh, role. The third thing is, there's a lot of plays and uh, stories and illustrations in the book. And often in social science, uh, where people do this, it's kind of trashy. And it's not, it's not really, um, it's uh, intended to enliven a boring presentation. Uh, in this book, the, these different formats are engaging. But more important, she uses them to try to make substantive points. So they're, they're interesting. They're worthwhile. They're, they're, they're not just interludes or illustrations. So those are the reasons the book is uh, uh, valuable uh, and beyond. And the other thing I would just say, I noticed about the book, it's in a Rutledge series of, oh, I guess you could, you could call it, it's mostly constructivist IR. It's got some other elements going on. But inside the book, there's a listing of the works in the series. And it's a very impressive and good series. And if you're teaching an IR theory course of some kind, someplace, you could easily provide part of the syllabus from, from that book listing, simply listing the, the colleagues, in a sense, of, of, of her book. Uh, and, I, and I commend that to you, because I know that many of you are teaching IR theory courses or something like that, and will be at some uh, future point. The, um, main image and theme of the book is an encounter between what uh, Lily calls Westphalia world and worldism. And this is um, evident by the end of the first chapter and thereafter, and it's an interesting and provocative encounter. But there's a big tension. And maybe I'll send this around, because you haven't seen the book. This is, uh, uh, I, I guessed, about right for the number of people who would be here. Uh, just how would I know? But this is a page of her manuscript that I copied. It's uh, page 149. Not that that would mean the slightest thing to you. 
so I'll wait for a minute till this gets around. We're not going to read it in unison or something. I'm just <laughs> going to... Is it mostly around? So uh, here's the tension. On, on the one side, on, the, on one side, the book argues for interaction and dialogue among traditions and across positions in different contexts. On the other side, the depiction of these two alternatives, the actual depiction in this chart and in the book, offers very little room for dialogue. It's, it's pretty clear well, beyond, well before the end of the book that West Philia world, in theory and practice, has basically nothing to recommend it. And on this page, if you look down the two columns, uh, West Philia world is identified with hierarchy, hegemony, and violence, while worldism represents fluidity, parity, and compassion, compassionate ethics. The two conceptions stand tar starkly opposed. The only thing that makes us, I would say, the only thing that makes us pay attention to what she calls Westphalia world is the prudential need to attend to certain forms of power that exist. But there's, not, there's no normativity on the Westphalia world side of town. It's, it's simply, as I said, uh, hierarchy, hegemony, and violence. So my basic uh, point that I'd like to make, and I'm going to illustrate it by going back to the 17th century for briefly, is that I think the virtues and dangers of these two kinds of perspectives are much more evenly distributed across these conceptions than the book proposes. And I won't uh, presume to try to develop all of the corners of this view, but I'm gonna briefly discuss the piece of Westphalia from which she draws the name and she refers to it of the conception she mainly opposes. And I'll try not to give a tedious two hour lecture. How many minutes do I have? I'm okay, I think. Um, eight. Oh, my goodness. Well, I, I could go into, so that the piece of Westphalia, which as Lily said is, uh, um, formalized in 1648, is the name commonly used for a group of treaties. Uh, there was no single treaty of Westphalia. There's a bunch of interlocking agreements, 1648 or so, done in a couple towns, I think, in what's now Germany. And they famously conclude the Thirty Years' War. And as she says, she's absolutely correct, they're rightly assigned a, a large role in developing a system of state sovereignty in Europe. It's not there was nothing like that before, but the, it's really a crucial moment of, of setting up state sovereignty. So, and from state sovereignty, as the book uh, emphasizes, a variety of problems and dangers arise. But if you actually, there's no, sing, as I said, there's no single treaty, but if you go back and look at the various agreements, the, the normativity is not all on the negative side, then or now. Here are some good things, and I'm half joking, I'm half joking with Lily, but I'm half serious, more than half serious. Here's some good things about the Peace of Westphalia. Uh, the first one is in the Peace of Westphalia, each prince gets the right, the right to determine the religion of his own state, which of course sounds proprietary, right? But it's also a huge deal historically because it enunciates a separate space for politics and religion. In other words, that it's not the church somewhere that gets the right to define the religion of territory, but that a prince, a secular figure, gets to define uh, the church, okay? Second is, this is the really big one, and of course is the memorable reason for parts of the Thirty Years' War. Christians living in principalities, the, I mean the Thirty Years' War, the, for those who weren't familiar, went on forever, obviously, but it involved, was a reformation, counter-reformation, and the, emerges partly from the reality that uh, warring Christian factions who do not accept each other's legitimate existence are interspersed in towns, cities, regions. 
So the two alternatives, if they really don't accept each other, are to simply kill all the ones you don't like in your territory, drive them out, or establish some modus vivendi. So the deal of the Treaty of Westphalia, enunciated, is that Christians uh, living in principalities where their denomination is not the state religion were guaranteed the right to practice their faith. We're, we're only talking about Christians. The uh, Treaty of Westphalia, uh, the Peace of Westphalia, does not include Jews in uh, 17th century Europe, much less Muslims, who of course had been kicked out of Southern Europe as of, I guess, the 14th century, early 15th century. In any case, this is a historic shift. And, and the point is, it's part of the notion of state sovereignty, that being a state would mean the recognition of difference within your territory and the need to accept the non-homogeneity of your population. So a strong notion of difference is encoded in the recognition of a sovereign state because of the reality of diverse populations in territories. Uh, the next thing is states are assigned the responsibility for warlike acts of their citizens and agents in and against other states. That's a pretty big deal. Uh, all the good, the, all the, the good and bad things of the peace of Westphalia are closely entwined. Boundaries to death, rigidity to death, closures against certain terrible things, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The last one, and nobody in the room will remember this. Is anybody Dutch in the room? Well, I don't know what Dutch IR people do, but I doubt if they're quite as nasty about Westphalianism as, as many others, because one of the biggest parts of the, of the Peace of Westphalia is the conclusion of the war between the Sp Kingdom of Spain and the Dutch Republic which had been going on not for 30 years, but 80 years, essentially, from the late 16th century. So the, the Peace of Westphalia announces, and it's extraordinarily modern and contemporary, even in the formulations then, that the Dutch have the right to self-determination. They don't use that word, but it's one step away from it. The Dutch have a right that this world of boundaries, rigidities, uh, you know, uh, declaration of X stops here and will patrol. It's, it's also bound up with the declaration of a right of self-determination. So the, and you can see the Dutch by that time are Protestant. So their escape from the Spanish Empire is both a religious escape but also a political escape because they were a republic. Okay, it doesn't. The Treaty of Westphalia doesn't say that everybody has to be Republican. It simply says that if the Dutch wish to be Republican, that's up to them. On the negative side, and I'll just make this as a, a final point about this before going on to the broader issue. Um, it's fine to uh, it's fine with me to associate sovereign states with multiple acts of cruelty and domination. Uh, how could you not? But it's worth noting in the actual history that the Peace of Westphalia was not required to produce the Spanish Inquisition, the modern European slave trade, or imperial expansion to the Americas, all of which predate the 1640s and are not in any obvious way determined by the state system, though they become entwined with it. In fact, the most extravagant pra practitioner of empire in modern times is uh, Britain, which is always a tough, tough fit in the, um, I mean, today, even today, they don't know where Britain is. They don't know what Britain is in Britain. They're fussing about it, right? They always fuss about it. It's a tough sell as a purely Westphalian state along the lines of, say, France later. So the, the Peace of Westphalia, and this is all talking about the, the violence domination side, one minute, of, of Lily's um, uh, opposition, establishes practices that in contemporary terms look like a right to self-determination and an acceptance of minimal toleration. The ensuing system places is, is really the metaphor is like, it's like law, law. It's always conservative in certain respects. That's law, 
fixes relations, okay? But what it really does is the state system blocks radical impulses, and I have just part of one paragraph, so I'm not gonna exceed my time limit that much, for, that would sweep aside the state system in favor of a totalizing and unifying ideology and practice. So the, the kind of people who run into trouble and announce the end of the state system are, do come from different political ideological places. Napoleon, after the French Revolution, that was Trotsky's deal, for heaven's sakes, end the state system and have world revolution now. The British Empire, I suppose, Bush for 10 minutes in the Middle East, <laughs> and, and Al-Qaeda everywhere have in common that they confront the state system Seriously, simply as a set of obstacles to, become, to be overcome in establishing a totalized regime of some kind. So how do we regard that? I would say we regard that with immense ambivalence, sensitivity to two sides or three sides of dilemmas <laughs> that we're still very much in the middle of, so that rather than seeing what we're doing as an effort to get rid of Westphalia, we're continually rereading it and, and reworking it to extract elements of it that seem to me rather indispensable alongside the things that Lily properly says we'd be glad to be done with. So thanks very much. From violence to ethics with compassion, subaltern memories. The name of the chapter is Intervene. And what I was most uh, deeply struck by when I read this chapter was the way in which Lily inspires the reader to think intellectually with intellectual rigor, depth, and all of that everything that comes with uh, that phrase, with a deeper philosophy that is also about grace and contemplation. She begins the chapter with a very interesting reading of Rafik Ilyas's documentary, The Legend of Fat Mama, which examines a little known aspect of India's relationship with China. Uh, during the 1962 war between India and China, a large number of Chinese Indians were interned in the western part of the country, and uh, many of them were Indian citizens, and that uh, moment of Indian history was something that got me to studying India-China relations, to work with Lily and our long collaboration with also the India-China Institute. So in many ways, this chapter also speaks to some of my intellectual questions. In this chapter, Lily develops the idea of a subaltern memory and dynamic relations. And that is in part developing this idea that we need to move away from a singular logic that tends to explain things in ways that seem tight, uh, fully explained, and not really subject to that many tinkering. Uh, more on that later. So when I read this chapter, I started to rethink that you know, if we abandon our commitments to singular logic or to appropriate definitions, what things really were, what things really are, and shave away from them the complexities that history, culture, context invariably supply, then we have to question whether India's relationship with China is really about the border, was the war really about the border, or something deeper, something more. And if they were, then what might it be? And as an example of what Lily sets up as this uh, departure from singular logic, she also shows how in addition to the exploitation, the internment, the imprisonment, the uh, radical overnight removal of uh, civil liberties of Chinese, na Chinese Indians, that there is also a sh larger, longer shared historical bond that is partly 
explained by the large number of travelers, monks, scholars that travel between India and China. And also more in contemporary terms, Hindi film, Hindi song, Indian food, uh, the whole new genre called Indian Chinese food. Some of you may have tasted it. It's very delicious. So she really asks us that, you know, it's, it's not about one unipolar definition of what IR is, not one unipolar definition of what happened, when, and for what reasons, but rather we, we take up the everyday embedded, embodied context of our lives and experiences to better understand who we are as Indians and Chinese. She draws from a very rich repertoire of traditions, uh, the healing arts, healing philosophies, and also ways of being. So she talks about uh, the Buddhist master Thich Nhat Hanh's contributions in, develop in, 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 in the ways in which the chapter develops the idea of interbeing, um, which means extending oneself to, a, oneself to a larger community and thereby a larger consciousness. She talks about Ayurveda, Zhong Yi, and therefore, needless to say, her assessment of where India-China uh, relations might, or the ways in which they might improve would be to include <coughs> ideas about balance among, amidst change, maintenance of multiple flows, internal and external resonance, progress via knowledge and consciousness. Now, I must also add that this is not some kind of new age application of IR. Please, if, if, that's, if anybody has this reading, I would uh, really engage in a little bit of a duel, if you will. It's not. It's, it's intellectually deep. There are over 110 footnotes in this chapter, and I looked them all up, and they are hard to argue with. So this is, it's, a, it's a different approach altogether. And what Lily gives us in this chapter is not just the theory behind it, but also the methodology. And the methodology here is brilliant. It's also a strategy, I must say, and that is the art of chatting as a method of contemplating interbeing, how we can leave our predetermined notions of what things have been and what they might be, but engage in a more fluid, open-ended discussion, contemplation, debate, reflection of the various issues that confront us today. And I have a little note here, which I, I might as well share with you. I, I wrote to myself, I will not critique. Somehow the word scrapes a bit after you've read Lily's chapter. So I would think that contemplation and reflection and deep engagement might be better um, containers to deal with what Lily is talking about. So I will read very brief portions only because I hope we will chat later, and I hope we can all intervene, right? OK. So they're very short, I promise you, because I don't want to ruin the, the delight you might have reading Lily's work. Take this anecdote. For example, it comes from Wang Hongwei, a noted scholar of South Asian religion and culture at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences in Beijing. He writes about visiting Nepal's famous poet, Chitta Dharridae, at his Nepal-China friendship house in Kathmandu. Normally, a courtesy call, the visit turned into something more. It became a chat. This is the quote. Shortly after sitting down and before the assemble gets, Ridae pulled out from a chest, a carefully preserved satin robe, showing it to us while saying, this was brought back by my ancestor a century ago from China, Tibet, when he traded there as a merchant. Though time has assaulted the satin robe's bright colors and frayed its hems into stingy strings, none of its affected the old poet in speech or spirit. The aspirations and nostalgia of the old poet's ancestors of China completely erased any sense of unfamiliarity we may have felt at first and greatly pulled together the distance between us. Lily writes, Wong's anecdote makes, makes the present, the past, and reimagines it for the future. What once was formal and distant becomes, in one instant, 
one informal, also informal and close. Both host and guests realize they have more in common than publicly recognized. So this is a paradigm shift in the ways in which uh, we relate to each other and perhaps uh, formulate the bl blueprint for a better uh, sense of the future. And then towards the end, towards the uh, conclusion of the chapter, she writes, the 1962 border was scars, but it need not blind. Subaltern memories still impress, despite all the denials, dismissals, and derision. What's the use of nostalgia in the face of power politics, the critical reader could ask. I respond, nostalgia returns us to ourselves. This return does not mean exclusion of others, whether defined as the West, Westphalia or, Asa, or some other label. Doing so would reproduce the same hegemonic situation we have today. Rather, returning means a self-recuperation. Let's chat. <laughs> And then I think it'd be nice to hear from all of you in the audience. Um, Karen, you said, would anyone listen? Um, I don't really care. <laughs> I don't really care if anybody listens. But I think people will listen, especially those people who have suffered from the violence of current world politics. Um, so when we ask, will anyone listen, we have to think of who is the one that we are thinking of. Are they IR scholars or are they uh, people like uh, Malana uh, Youssef, is that her last name, uh, who was shot in the head by the Taliban because she wanted to go um, get some education. Uh, that kind of rigidity is what we are trying to address here. And um, I think Pyle gave us a really great example from the book of how chatting can be implemented uh, actually in everyday life. And one of the things that this book tries to do is to erase the distinction between high politics and low politics, uh, what's outside in the world and how we experience our daily lives. Um, David, I don't have any quibbles with you regarding some of the virtues of the Treaty of Westphalia. It really did do a lot of good in Europe. Uh, that's why it lasted so long, and that's why it was held as a model for the rest of the world. What my book tries to address is the encounter between Westphalians and the rest of the world. So it's not necessarily uh, the substance of, uh, of Westphalia and what it has come to represent that I uh, debate and critique, but rather the way in which the encounter has been handled. Um, and uh, as I mentioned a very uh, I think clearly, uh, my approach aims not to overthrow or to replace, but rather to engage and to negotiate so that we can reach a better balance uh, between what we currently have and what we hope we will have. And Pyle, thank you very much for reading passages from the chapter. I didn't think of doing that myself, so thank you for doing that, to give the audience a taste of what the book is about. And, uh, and I... Uh, really love the way that you ended by saying, let's chat. So let's chat. <laughs> One of my favorite pastimes. <laughs>
there is a problem with second order Westphalian IR in other parts of the world, which reflects the kind of colonial violence that I mentioned earlier, which is that other parts of the world feel they have to emulate the West in order to demonstrate they are as good as the West. That kind of game has been going on for too long. It's about time we change the game. I don't know if it's trend. I just know that this is something that I had to do, uh, given that I myself am very much a product of both East and West. Uh, so I'm not coming to the West as a um, uh, outsider. Uh, consequently, I feel very comfortable in um, critiquing the West. But similarly, I don't come to the, uh, Asia as an outsider, and I feel very comfortable in critiquing Asia. The kind of uh, hegemonic uh, moves that a lot of scholars in Asia are doing are really very 20th century, and one could even say 19th century. And so we need to catch up with the times. Thank you. Yes. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Um, can you go up to the microphone and ask a question? <laughs> Otherwise, the, the, no? It's okay? Oh, so you can sit down, okay. yeah. Um, when you were developing your theory, were you clear and away? How did you stay away from Orientalism mm -hmm. um, and kind of, so that you were able to better form your theory without being accused of kind of sectioning off the East as the other? Well, precisely because of the pockets of co-implication in Taoist yin-yang theory, it, it serves as a mechanism for not orientalizing or not occidentalizing. And in fact, I wanted to mention this in my response to David as well. I'm not setting up a stark oppositional relationship between yin and yang because in the chapter, for example, on US-China relations, I show how within uh, the United States there is another America that exists that relates very much to the kind of China uh, that uh, um, uh, is aspirational and, and uh, f subaltern, actually. Uh, so, you know, the governmental elites, people like Charles Krauthammer, you know, and uh, William Crystal, the kind of America that they represent is very limited. It is not the only America. And in the book, I show how there is another America of, um, you know, the black guy peas, for example, and uh, of Marvin Gaye. Uh, that's also a, an America. And from that basis, we need to balance our understanding of what the United States represents in terms of itself vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. So um, the pockets of co-implication uh, provide a mechanism for not being rigid or essentializing. Yeah. I think the black eyed peas are British. And they borrow from Bollywood songs. Is that right? Five, <laughs> two songs, 1972 and 78. Just Fergie is an outsider, right? <laughs> yes. Um, so I'm just thinking about partly because I haven't read your book, so I, I go on that mic asking the question and I feel so unprepared. Um, but looking at the chart that was passed out earlier that you had up on your slide, I'm just wondering, looking at these descriptions, hierarchy, hegemony, violence on one side, which are infused with notions of power because how we understand these concepts. On the other side, fluidity, parity, ethics with compassion, we don't tend to think of power, but where is power? Fluidity can hide sources of power and nodes of power. So my question is, if someone were to describe a Stalinism in very positive kind of normative terms, power would hide perhaps in offices, right? Official power, which you can target and you can think it's good or bad or you know it's legitimate. Uh, in Taoism, I presume, it's presented, and Andianism presented its own particular favorable story. Right? Uh, but does that mean there is no power in practical implications? And if there is, uh, how do we attend to the fact that power still manifests itself somehow? So I guess my question is, where is power in the other side? I kind of know where it is on the Valian side. And specifically, when I'm thinking of loving, which is part of the um, triad there, uh, loving can be quite insidious, can be quite oppressive, can be quite hurtful, right? Partly because of imbalance in power relationships. Mm -hmm. So I'm just kind of wondering about that. Mm -hmm. I'm always interested in power, so you know me. Yeah. So right. that was First of all, we that. have to redefine our understanding of power. We have to get away from the Westphalian definition of power as A, making B do what B otherwise would not do. There's another definition of power which is generative and productive. Um, and um, in the Taoist understanding of power, it comes not from any singular attribute but from a relationship. Power can be both negative and positive, just as any relationship can be both positive and negative. So 
uh, the, uh, the power in multiple worlds, for example, comes from their encounters with one another and how they have dealt with one another th through the Westphalian understandings of power and yet still survive uh, to produce uh, what people live with on an everyday basis. Uh, in the book, I do talk about alternative understandings of power and how they have been enacted uh, through different episodes of uh, Chinese history, for example. Uh, there, there, there's too much of a stereotyping of Chinese history is full of only violence or only oppressiveness and not alternative applications of social relations uh, uh, with uh, politics in mind. Uh, so I think that um, if we were to look at these alternative paradigms of power, we would broaden our uh, understanding of not only what it is, but where, where it exists and how it can be used. Yes. So in this book, or in this paradigm, what would be your definition of power? You say it can be generative and productive, but so what, what would be your definition of power in this paradigm? Um, it, it's at many levels. Uh, for example, uh, the ability to listen and speak creatively, that is a kind of power. Aesthetics is a kind of power. Creativity is definitely a kind of power. So w we have to as I said, uh, broaden our, our understanding of power beyond state power or monopoly of violence, for example. And uh, if we recognize love as a kind of power, for example, then uh, we would order our lives and our worlds in a very different way. Yes. I enjoyed the... Uh your, your, your beginning your comments about the, the multiple worlds and how the multiple worlds are the component parts of, of a larger thing where they exist with a human. It's a quite a larger thing. And then I was thinking about um, the, wor the word hegemony. Because recently in, uh, I was in a conversation in Latin America where people were, were talking about hegemony being a good thing. And I always thought it was a bad thing. When I hear Billy speak, it's a bad thing. Or I hear, and they said, well, no, actually, it's a good thing because what it meant in this was a conversation with Buenos Aires that the, it meant that the order that we had convinced sufficient number of people of what our ideological perspective was, and we were all together in the same, it was almost like a compact, and we had achieved hegemony. I said, well, wait a second, that's not the way we understand it in English, where we, we assume there's some sort of oppression or power or control. So as you were going on, and, and particularly the comments uh, from the commentators, I was thinking, so what's going to happen when the book is translated into another language? <laughs> yeah, right? And which one, which one of these concepts themselves are so culturally based that it will be hard to translate every now. Have you fantasized about that? that, that happened I have been to many fantasies, but that <laughs> <laughs> is not one of them. Uh, but Mike, do they use the word hegemony in Spanish? What is the word hegemony in Spanish? Yeah. And it has the same. It seemed, yeah, it's the same. I always thought it was, you know, oppression, but then I hear people talking about it as something that, that means all together and connected and there's a certain amount of order which we need as a precondition, you know, to avoid some of the things that they said we want and we're going to try to avoid from the system. So, and it was kind of interesting. I was sort of wondering... Well, the, 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 the there might be an understanding of hegemony as order, right? That, that all parties want social order. Uh, Nicolas? I think uh, the concept of hegemony we speak about in Latin America is uh, the Gramscian conception of hegemony. And it comes from the populist uh, theoretical uh, idea of uh, Laclau, from Ernesto uh, Laclau. And I think it's contextualized in the neoliberal way of the depoliticizing the, the sphere of mm -hmm. elections. And so this whole tendency of Every party tending to be a center, uh, ideologically center, and you know of these kind of parties that catch all, all kinds of uh, they they don't really polarize. So everything they propose all the same, and the concept you are using it's a concept that comes from the Waltzian theory, neorealism or realism. So 
it's another kind of HMI to make it simple. Um, so if I understand uh, what you just said correctly, um, people like a hegemonic order because it, it takes away all of the ideological infighting that goes on, right? Like the government shutdown in, in Washington. The good thing is that you know who you're voting for because you, there's, a, there's spectrums, ideological spectrums, so you know what to expect. So you know who's the left and who's the right. And if the left has consolidated on hegemony, has, is able to, uh, to collect all these demands from the people and represent them, that makes them legitimate. It's the idea of, of these connections of demands. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's okay to have multiple definitions of a single word, multiple understandings and multiple uses of it, um, and to uh, e explain the contextual uh, factors that lead to these different understandings of a, sing of a, of a single term. Um, in fact, my whole uh, project is not to reduce anything to singularity, but to multiply it. So uh, I'd say that this is a further enrichment of the term hegemony. Uh, one does not necessarily exclude the other. Yes? Yes. Hi. Um, my name's Ginger, and I'm in GPA. Um, when you were explaining multiple worlds in contrast to a pyramid top-down model, I had a, a vision of like almost like spherical in terms of instead of um, forcing power onto another and making Egyptian do it, <coughs> power comes from like a source and it blossoms out from there and it's not so much um, a coercion but an inevitable agreement mm -hmm. of that. I don't, I don't know, um, mm -hmm. the spherical model, I don't know if mm -hmm. that's accurate in mm -hmm. my, my interpretation of what you mm -hmm. said. Mm -hmm. Right. In other words, um, there's more engagement. Uh, parties uh, communicate with one another, engage with one another. They engage in a, like a dance, for example, yeah. as opposed to being clobbered over the head and say, you got to do what I tell you to do. And I really appreciated that, um, what you said, how it needs to be um, both working as one rather than not just a replacement. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like we need, what you're saying is converging on a different definition of social mm -hmm. equality in the sense that one isn't over the other, but both are needed. Conflict is essential. Mm -hmm. We don't want to get rid of war and conflict. Well, we can't. Exactly. Yeah. Conflict is essential to moving forward. Right. And right. both those polarities we're thinking about. Right. Yeah. And in a sense, you know, again, re responding to David, Westphalia is part of us. It is in ingrained within us. We can't get rid of it. Uh, Franz Fanon said, uh, to get rid of colonialism, let's kill the colonizer. Well, you kill the colonizer, you kill part of yourself. You know, that is the problem. And I think we should learn from these experiences. Um, I don't want to hog the platform here. I'd like the panelists to um, also respond a little bit to the discussion that we're having and any thoughts that you may have. Are there questions? Oh, there's a question back there. Yeah, um, I don't know if I think this is probably an observation um, in relation to you talked about uh, Hinduism a little bit, and here we are uh, doing a nine day fast called Navaratri, and um, in relation to power, in relation to interbeing, there is this idea that the, the head is related to Shiva. Mm -hmm. and the lower is related to Shakti. And in this fast, you're trying to make these two powers, these two forces come together. And one cannot exist without the other. And it's amazing, within the end of Navaratri, the fasting of it, that this is presented, <laughs> and, uh, that it's a mere observation. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. But I'd like to invite the panelists to say, additional words, uh, thoughts that you might have had from this discussion. A chat, after all, is from multiple sources. So um, I think the good, one of the many good things about the book is it gives you a license uh, in the following sense, that it, it's not fair to expect anybody to present a relatively original perspective 
and work out all its implications and dangers in a single book. No, nobody, nobody has to meet that standard. You just don't, okay? So, but when you write, uh, so I'm not, this is not at all a criticism of the book, but uh, so a, a project for a future article or, or, or I mean, it sounds like you're writing, book, writing up a storm down <laughs> here, but at some point in this storm, uh, Another way of putting my challenge to you, and maybe more productive way, is to say, write an article at some point about what you see as the main hazards of the worldist perspective. What, what dangers would it present as it entered the world more seriously? What would it miss? What, what, what risks would it uh, create for people who took it seriously? Um, and you know, that, that, that's a kind of, uh, not many people are, 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 that's intended as an intellectual compliment in the following sense. Most people are too brittle about the uh, perspectives they develop to take on such a project because they're committed to defending what they produced and then the next article is explaining again why it's even better than, their, than they first thought. <laughs> so <laughs> since, since you don't have to spend the next 10 years doing that, at some point write something and say, you know, what are the, what are the, problems of this perspective and how would one go on, uh, go uh, about thinking about them? Thank you. Karen? I don't want to say, mu say much at this stage. I'd prefer to stay in listening mode, but I was just listening to the responses again and I, and I just think what's great about this is, you know, I teach an IR theory course um, in Cape Town and my students always, you know, we spend a whole semester critiquing IR theory and at the end of it they say, okay, but what now? And I really never have an answer for them, and now I can prescribe this book. So, you know, I think. Thanks for that. Lily. Well, thank you. <laughs> I had a similar response, actually, because most of the, you know, when we get out of class, there's always that feeling hanging. What can we do? How would it look like? I think mm -hmm. that question I get most often what would it look like? And there are multiple examples of that here. Uh, so, I think. I would like to test it out mm -hmm. for some time before I discovered the hazards. <laughs> but the hazards <laughs> may not be of the perspective. It may be in relation to other things. So it's difficult to predict it in a positivist sort of way. Yes. I wonder, um, you're writing some very interesting stuff lately, so sort of in your art and your scholarship. Um, what's moved you into this sort of curation mode, so curating different forms of materials and presenting an alternative, you know, graphic or poetic or aesthetic. What's the impetus for that sort of shift? Maybe you've always been there. And, and what openings do you think that kind of shift provides? Um, Mary is referring to my second book, which is coming out in February. <laughs> and it's a fairy tale. Uh, uh, again, my childhood friend Patricia Robertson helped me with that Patty, can you raise your hand just to let people know who you are? <laughs> she is my secret weapon. Um, I wrote the fairy tale as the yin to the yang of this academic book. I felt that I would be lopsided, I would be incomplete if I didn't write that fairy tale because that fairy tale uh, tells in a substantive way this alternative world that this uh, academic book gestures towards. Um, so it, I felt I had to do that, and, and so that book came into being in that context. As for other works that I'm doing, for example, I'm planning a book of plays as a pedagogy for IR classes and students. Um, I'm just trying to experiment with alternative ways of learning so that we're not always learning in the same old way. I remember in graduate school, I was reading all this really dense text that I'm supposed to master, and it alienated me because it was not my tradition. This dense text came from a very European continental tradition, and I just felt it didn't speak to me, and yet I was supposed to learn it. I was supposed to master it, and in mastering it, I had to cut off a chunk of myself or shut off a chunk of myself, and that is the personal experience of epistemic violence that uh, so motivates this work right now. So um, I'm trying to be true to the Taoist sense of creativity through playfulness and aesthetics and liven our profession a little bit. Our profession, like economics, is a dismal science. 
and uh, the people in it take everything so seriously, especially, excuse the male gender here, but the men, you know, because it's a sign of masculinity, it's a sign of virility, that's what international relations is about, hyper-masculinity, all these wars, these bombs, these rockets, and this is well documented. The feminists have come up with a critique, but they haven't really come up with an alternative, and so, um, I am motivated by that also. But thank you for raising the issue. Well, by all things written by Lily Lang, it's the answer that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thanks for Lang. <laughs> um, so I've got to read, obviously, a number of chapters. But um, David, I'm sorry, I don't know your last name. Or I okay. to be Dr. Dr. David. Um, I thought that was a really great question. Um, and I, in reading some of this, have thought about that a little bit, but not re realizing it until now, being able to articulate it, which what are some of the dangers. And it's precisely, I think this, the way that you um, felt that violence and having to read some of this IR theory is the, I don't know what would be in the, the opposite of that, because in reading this, to sit down and have the conversations, the discussions, the chats, it's not just about having this um, superficial chat, but really letting down and being self-reflective. And I think as a side effect of that, that that's where some of the negative side effects or some of the um, psychological or emotional dangers maybe may lie. Mm. But <clears throat> I think it might, so might also be a necessary danger in um, crossing to that transition where we can get somewhere else. This, but I would suggest that any process of learning uh, provokes that kind of danger. Any process where you open your mind to a new idea, regardless of what that idea is, raises the possibility of that danger. Danger can be good. It's mm -hmm. exciting. You know, it's not necessarily a, a bad thing. That's right. It's just um, a, a, a side effect that maybe it's a risky yeah, venture. Exactly. Yeah, learning is a risky venture. It is not. It is not what people, most people, especially in um, the social sciences, most people tend to think of it like engineering or economics, uh, where you learn a formula, you learn a logarithm, and that's it. But rather, the social sciences do involve um, social relations, society, people, feelings, uh, insights. And uh, these are risky ventures once you enter into that domain. Um, I had a student once, I won't mention where or who, who once said to me, how can I write a master's thesis without politics in it? Uh, and I said, you're in the wrong program. Uh, you're studying the wrong thing. This is not business school, for example. This is, you know, business tries to um, teach people how to do, how to make money in a kind of mechanistic way, although that's not necessarily good business, but that's what conventional business schools teach. Um, social science does uh, stir the waters. And chatting, like water, has many layers to it. You can start shallow. You can start by saying, you like my shoes? Uh, and then you can go more deeply. For example, in the passage that uh, Pyle read out, um, the poet uh, in Nepal brought out a robe just to show that his ancestor traveled to China in uh, decades past, and yet the response to that was very different. Uh, so we cannot determine the responses we have to events or people or things, um, but uh, uh, they do, uh, they can stir the waters deeply. Yes? Lily, well, yeah, on that last part, um, I would argue that business MBA dissertation, or uh, theses, if, if they exist, or MBA study is full of politics. Yes, they and are. And you would agree. Mm -hmm. But that student could have written that MA thesis in our program or in some other program without politics. How so? <laughs> well, <laughs> politics as ordinarily understood. And I, I should think that that would have fit into your perspective today. Um, yes, uh, just as um, you know, X exists, negative X also exists. 
But does that people, does that make a people in the business school don't know that they're political? People writing here uh, don't have to be political, but they are. Um, I'm not saying she had to be political. Uh, she wanted uh, to avoid the study of politics in the subject that she wanted to look at. Well, again, for example, answer, looking at uh, government accounts. Uh, you know, doing a study of government accounts. Oh, uh, sort of disembodied from. Yeah, right. Something completely system. abstract and supposedly disembodied, but of course we all know that budgets are very political. I think I know who that student was. <laughs> <laughs> And on that note, we will call an end to this uh, evening's events. Thank you again for coming. I really appreciate all the panelists and your careful reading of my manuscript and your uh, comments and the audience as well. Thank you very much. <laughs>